Here I'm going to derive the least squares estimators in simple linear regression. I assume that you've already been introduced to simple linear regression, and that you have a grasp of the model and the parameters, and that you have a basic knowledge of derivatives such as the power rule and the chain rule. To refresh our memories, here is the simple linear regression model. Beta naught and beta 1 are unknown parameters, and we estimate them with the statistics beta naught hat and beta 1 hat. These estimators are based on sample data. Epsilon is a random error term, and it is not itself a parameter. Recall that the least squares method chooses the parameter estimators beta naught hat and beta 1 hat such that the sum of squared residuals is minimized. Here's a scatter plot of a sample data set, and I'm going to draw the least squares regression line in. This is the least squares regression line for these data points, although we don't have the formulas just yet. There are an infinite number of different lines that we could draw through those points, and this is one of them, the least squares line. This line yields the predicted value of y for any given x. The residuals are the differences between the observed values of y and their predicted value based on the regression line. This value of y would have a positive residual that's equal to the vertical distance from the point to the line. This value of y would have a negative residual, where the magnitude is equal to the vertical distance from the point to the line. The sum of squared residuals is the sum, over all n sample values, of the squared difference between the observed and predicted values of y. In other words, this quantity. All summations in this video are indexed from 1 to n, because we have n sample values. But to leave a little less clutter in the video, I'm going to omit the limits of summation. Choosing a line that minimizes the sum of squared residual makes some sense at first blush, as we would like those residuals to be small. But why squared? Why not something else, like the absolute value? Well, I'm not going to get into those details here, as I discussed that elsewhere, but suffice it to say that these least squares estimators have some nice mathematical properties and are often a very good choice of estimator in regression. But what are the formulas for these estimators? It's all well and good to say that we minimize the sum of squared residuals, but how do we do that? How do we find the values that give us this green line? We want to minimize a certain function, and that sounds like a job for calculus. We're going to take the partial derivatives with respect to beta naught hat and beta 1 hat. We will then set those partial derivatives equal to 0, and then we will solve for beta naught hat and beta 1 hat. To be sure that we've found a minimum and not a maximum or a saddle point, we could check the second order conditions. I'm not going to do that here, but rest assured that our resulting formulas will in fact correspond to the minimum possible sum of squared residuals. Let's start by taking the partial derivative with respect to beta naught hat. First note that the derivative of a sum is the sum of the derivatives, so we can take the derivative inside the summation. Now we've got a squared term, so by the power rule, the 2 comes down and the exponent disappears. Well, it becomes 2 minus 1, or 1. We can't forget the chain rule. We now need to multiply by the derivative of what's inside the brackets. As it relates to the derivative, the y sub i and beta 1 hat times x sub i terms do not involve beta naught hat. So those go to 0, and we're left with the derivative of minus beta naught hat and that is simply minus 1. So we multiply by minus 1. Cleaning this up a bit, we can put that minus 2 out front, in front of the summation. Now with respect to beta 1 hat. Again, the derivative of a sum is the sum of the derivatives. And again, by the power rule, the 2 comes out front, and the exponent becomes 1. But again, we can't forget the chain rule. Once again, we must multiply by the derivative of what's inside the brackets. Here, as it relates to the derivative, y sub i and beta naught hat do not involve beta 1 hat. So those go to 0, and we're left with minus x sub i. So we need to multiply by that. Cleaning this up a bit, 
we can again put the minus 2 out front, and we're left with this summation. And now we set the partial derivatives equal to 0. Here we have two equations in two unknowns, and we're going to solve these to find our estimators beta naught hat and beta 1 hat. How do we do that? First we'll get an expression for beta naught hat, and that expression will involve beta 1 hat, and we'll substitute that into the other equation and solve for beta 1 hat. Note that we can simplify this right away by dividing by minus 2, as that term disappears because the other side is 0. Let's solve the first equation for beta naught hat. If we carry the summation through, we get these terms. Note that with respect to the summation, beta naught hat and beta 1 hat are constants. In a statistical sense, they will be random variables that take on a value once we get our sample. But with respect to the summation over the sample values, they are constants, so they can come outside of the summation. The sum of beta naught hat from 1 to n turns into n times beta naught hat, and beta 1 hat comes outside of the summation in its term. Now if we isolate the n times beta naught hat term, we get this. Dividing both sides by n, we get this. The sum of y over n is y bar, and the sum of x over n is x bar. And we end up with beta naught hat equaling y bar minus beta 1 hat times x bar. That doesn't do us much good without knowing what beta 1 hat is. Let's see if we can piece that side of things together. Here's the partial derivative with respect to beta 1 hat set to 0. And the trick here is to note that we've already solved for beta naught hat and got an expression in terms of beta 1 hat, so we can substitute that in for beta naught hat. Now we're getting somewhere, because we've only got one unknown in this equation. At this point, there are many ways of going about isolating beta 1 hat. I'm going to take a route that gets us the expression in a way that it's very commonly expressed, but there are other paths we could take. Here let's gather similar terms together, putting y sub i with y bar, and x sub i with x bar. This last line is the same as the first line on the next slide. I'm going to carry the summation through, but I'm going to leave y sub i minus y bar and x sub i minus x bar grouped together. Because with a little inside knowledge, I know how we typically write the final expressions. Others might take a different approach, but still come to the same conclusion in the end. Now we can recognize that, with respect to the summation, beta 1 hat is a constant, and can come outside of the summation. And moving that term to the other side, we end up with this. Now dividing through, we have an expression for beta 1 hat. Let's look at this on the next page. This is one way of expressing the formula for beta 1 hat, but we don't typically write it in this fashion. We often write it this way. It might not be obvious, but these two numerators are equivalent, and these two denominators are also equivalent. I'll illustrate that in a moment or two. First note that in this formula, the denominator is the sum of squared deviations of x. That's the numerator of the sample variance formula if we calculated the sample variance of x, completely ignoring y. That's often called the corrected sum of squares of x, and may be represented with something like ssx, or ssxx, or sxx, depending on the notation your source is using. The numerator is the sum of the products of the x and y deviations. This is the numerator of the formula when we calculate the sample covariance of x and y. It is often referred to as the corrected sum of products, and you may see it represented with spxy, or sxy, or possibly ssxy. Now I'm going to show that those two numerators are equivalent, and those two denominators are equivalent. 
That identity comes in very handy in some proofs and calculations. Looking at this form of the sum of products, we can multiply through by the second term, splitting up the first term. Now since x bar is a constant with respect to the summation, it can come outside the summation. And the sum of these deviations for any variable is always zero. I'll let you verify that final bit for yourself. But the second term becomes zero, and we're left with the sum of products equaling the sum of x sub i times y sub i minus y bar. Also note that we could easily swap the roles of x and y. So it is also equal to the sum of y sub i times x sub i minus x bar. This identity comes in handy in some proofs and derivations. Similarly, the sum of squares of x can be written like this. If we split it up as before, and once again realize that, with respect to the summation, x bar is constant and can be taken out front, we get this. And once again, the sum of the deviations is zero, so this second term drops out. And of course, that works for y as well. Just something to keep in mind, as that identity comes in handy from time to time. Finally, to recap, under the least squares criterion, where we choose the parameter estimates that minimize the sum of squared residuals, these are the appropriate formulas for the estimators. Of course, we don't typically calculate these by hand, and we will rely on software to calculate them for us. But the software will use these formulas, or an equivalent variant, 